Evil cultist bound in service to Demogorgon or extremely passionate cosplayer? Sometimes the difference is hard to tell, but don't worry, today I'm going to give you the skinny on just exactly what a skinwalker is, at least as far as D&D 3rd edition is concerned. Hello and welcome to Monster of the Week, the show where we dig up old monsters from past editions of D&D and bring them to light so we can use them in our current 5th edition games. My name is Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and today we're going to be taking a look at a very interesting creature, at least in terms of amalgamations of different legends and cultures go, which comes to us from Dungeon Magazine issue 145. Now for those of you who have been following the channel for quite some time, I'm sure you saw the title and thought, wait, a skinwalker? Didn't you do a video about a wendigo a long while back, which is extremely similar in terms of theming and in fact in some legends they might even be considered the same thing and to you i say yes that is absolutely true however this monster while it is called a skinwalker in name is nothing like the legend of the navajo skinwalkers or anything really even related to that its only similarity to that type of creature is in the fact that it is called a skinwalker. And there's a really good reason why it's called that, and that reason is that basically whoever made this stat block for Dungeon Magazine just wanted to make a really bad pun, and I am 100% in support of that, even if it makes the creature seem a bit misleading until you read more about it. So, if we're not talking about the legend of the Navajo Skinwalker, then what exactly are we talking about? Well, the monster of the week this week, as I said, comes to us from Dungeon Magazine and is essentially part of an adventure that was meant to be kind of a spin-off of the traditional Isle of Dread module. To give you an idea, it's very similar in theming to Tomb of Annihilation. It's kind of traversing through the jungle, encountering all kinds of weird and mysterious creatures and dungeon delving, that kind of thing. So what a skinwalker actually is, is a humanoid, usually a human, but it could be any humanoid, theoretically, that belongs to a cult of Demogorgon. Now, as I briefly mentioned, this creature is kind of a mashup of cultures because you have that one extremely evocative piece of imagery that comes to mind when you think skinwalker, but the actual theming of this creature is kind of more like an Aztec warrior. Except the idea being what if there was a sect of Aztec warriors that worshipped Demogorgon and formed a horrible cult to him that bound the skins of demonic lions to their bodies. Because see, in order to create a skinwalker, these cultists engage in this horrid ritual where they basically flay someone alive and then burn them and then also burn them with the pelt of a demonic lion creature. And the two beings, the humanoid person and this lion creature skin kind of meld into one cohesive unit. And that's actually what you're looking at right now. And you end up essentially with an extremely powerful warrior who is infused with demonic magic and of course the madness of Demogorgon and the demonic lion pelt literally takes on a life of its own as it's attached to this new being and can kind of still move its arms and grant some of its senses and that kind of thing to the warrior. I gotta say, I have to give them props for this artwork because in concept, it would be so easy to make this creature look extremely goofy, but it actually looks horrifying. I mean, that guy alone is a threat to be contended with. And then when you add in the whole lion muscular bonding tendril situation it's just a whole lot of nope so today we're going to talk about just exactly what this creature can do in battle and it absolutely is as frightening as it looks then we're going to move on and talk about some plot hooks and some different ways we could kind of incorporate this creature into our games and this is one of those cases where it's a very viable creature in terms of combat abilities but it also has a lot of really neat story implications so i'm excited to get into that later on too now, without further ado, let's take a moment and talk about... So when it comes to doing battle, these creatures are absolute monsters in melee combat. As that extremely evocative artwork would suggest, the absolute worst place you can be is directly in front of one of these things. They get a grand total of four melee attacks. They can attack twice with their claws, meaning the actual lion's arms. Now this attack only does a small amount of slashing damage if it connects, 
But these warriors are fond of coating their claws and their arrows as well in a certain type of poison. And that forces the target to make a constitution save or become poisoned and take a little bit more poison damage. And its other two attacks, it makes with its actual original human arms. It can do a shield bash, which causes some bludgeoning damage and can also knock the target prone if they fail their strength save. And it can also make an attack with its Maka Wheat, which is an extremely brutal weapon. Now, if you're not familiar with this weapon of war, it is a weapon that was most commonly known as the prime destructive tool of choice for Aztec warriors. It is essentially a finely crafted club, often ornate in nature, and all along the edge of it is just embedded tons of very jagged pieces of obsidian. Now obsidian is literally volcanic glass. It's very fragile and prone to breaking. However, it is so sharp. It is sharper than any metal really that we would be able to forge, especially in a medieval setting like D&D. In fact, these weapons are so sharp, there are actual real-life accounts of Aztec warriors using them to behead horses in combat. The drawback, of course, being that it is literally glass, so it shatters quite easily. But that's not a huge issue, because both for this creature and the actual Aztec warriors that inspired it, when you go into combat with this weapon, after the battle is over, you can easily replace the obsidian fragments by just jamming new ones in along that specially designed ridge. Now originally the purpose of this weapon was to cause a lot of damage and maim the target to the point where they could not fight anymore, but not necessarily kill them, because a lot of those soldiers who survived the battle but were horribly wounded would often be taken back as captives. Of course, with the end goal being to sacrifice them. So you could of course implement that in the way that the Skinwalker does battle as well. Maybe it deals non-lethal damage on purpose with the kind of vision in mind that it's going to take any unconscious party members or other targets captive and eventually sacrifice them to make more Skinwalkers. Or they could merely just be sacrifices to Demogorgon, but we're getting ahead of ourselves here. The thing to take away from this is I really wanted to find a way to make this weapon not just essentially a stick that dealt X amount of damage. I wanted it to feel like it was different than just a longsword, even though in the original rules it's pretty much the same, it's just flavorfully different. So what I changed up here is that this weapon deals 1d8 bludgeoning damage, which is the club component, and it also does a d8 slashing damage, which would be the obsidian component. And the weapon also scores a critical hit on a roll of 17 to 20. Meaning that this weapon has a much, much higher chance to critically wound the person who it is being stabbed into. The only catch here, of course, is once this weapon rolls a critical hit, it only does bludgeoning damage for the rest of the fight until it can be repaired, because that obsidian glass is going to shatter and remain stuck in whatever target took the brunt of that horrible blow. So essentially this weapon is going to do a pretty decent amount of damage throughout the fight with a good chance that you're going to see one devastating hit. Now as I mentioned, these creatures don't have a lot in the way of ranged combat, but they do have one option and that is their longbow. While their prime fighting position is up close and personal, they can make two longbow attacks per round and those longbow arrows are of course dipped in poison. And this is the same poison that is coated on their claws. Now in terms of special tricks and that kind of thing, these guys do have a couple things up their sleeve. They do have keen hearing and smell, which they of course owe to their demonic lion counterpart. And that of course gives this creature advantage on perception checks that rely on hearing or smell. This also kind of plays into the theme of these creatures as sort of hunters, where they are very much ambush tacticians. While once they get into combat, they are absolutely ferocious, they're not stupid about it. They're actually fairly intelligent, so they're not going to just run headlong into danger. They will set up what, at least to them, seems like the most favorable situation for an encounter. And they do have proficiency in stealth as well, so they will absolutely stalk a target until the prime moment presents itself. The other neat thing about these guys is they have an empathic link with all other skinwalkers created by the same cult. Since they were all bound to Demogorgon, they all kind of share this communal empathic link. So in the broad sense of things, this allows them to kind of be aware of what other skinwalkers are feeling and if they're in danger or if they're safe, that kind of thing. Very base level emotions. 
This does mean if one of them is to be attacked, at least other skinwalkers in the area will know something's wrong and maybe they'll come to help, maybe they won't, who knows. But what this means in battle is that any skinwalkers within 60 feet actually have a much closer connection because they're literally closer to one another physically. And they can actually see and sense things through each other's senses. This is all just to say that if one of them becomes aware of something, the entire group of them will become aware of that thing. Or if one of them can see a target, the entire group can see that target. So this is very useful for them in terms of setting traps and avoiding traps, but it also means that they can't be flanked unless all of them are flanked. So if you have three skinwalkers in a group and your party's trying to surround them, they're not going to be able to get those flanking bonuses if you use flanking rules unless all three of those skinwalkers were surrounded. And honestly, that's pretty much it. These creatures are fairly simple to understand, but I feel like they will be a lot of fun to run in combat because they have so many different martial abilities and because of how ferocious they are, it'll be really interesting to see players deal with that. And once they realize, oh, they have to worry about constitution saves from being poisoned and worry about not being knocked down by shield bashes and that kind of thing, it can definitely change the flow of combat and how that works. Now, we're going to move on to what makes this creature actually really interesting and talk about some... So as I touched on in the last section, a really interesting way that you could use these creatures is, of course, in service to a cult of Demogorgon, and these would be their kind of primary defenders. I mean, maybe you'd have kind of groups of cultists, and within each group there would be one of these guys with them if you're kind of running a lower level game, and that would be the sort of boss monster for that encounter. Or for a mid or higher level game, you could have just packs of these things roaming around in four or five, and that would make for a really interesting and tough encounter for the party. And of course, this brings us back to that whole idea of sacrificial captives. If you're not running a game that really has a cult of Demogorgon in it already, and if you aren't, you should be, but if you're not and you want to use these creatures, you could very easily have them kind of show up in a story where they're kidnapping people from the village or they're raiding the village and not killing people, but knocking a lot of people unconscious and dragging them away and probably killing a few people in the process. And then of course the party has to go and rescue the captives from the cultists. It's a very classic D&D trope. But you could get away from that whole Demogorgon thing altogether and just use them as very weird kind of mutated monsters. Maybe they're created by a magical mishap. Maybe the lion on their back isn't actually demonic, but it was just some kind of weird fantasy creature or even just a straight up lion. And some kind of wizard has created these creatures to guard its tower or its area or whatever. And for that matter, as much as they are made with that kind of demonic lion hide theme in mind, you can use any creature you want. If you want these guys to have giant horrible elephant skins on their back, that would be horrific, but why not? Go for it. Maybe within the society of these skinwalkers, they have different types, depending on what kind of animal you go and kill and come back and do this ritual. You're bonded with a different type of animal and it gives different people different abilities. Perhaps someone who's bonded with a wolf gets extreme speed or extra cunning. Maybe someone who's bonded with a bear gets extreme strength and extra abilities that have to do with that. I mean, the temptation is definitely there to turn this into a lycanthrope-esque kind of sect of monsters that aren't really becoming one with that animal, but more so merging with it and becoming something completely new. Following that same train of thought of the kind of wizard who's created these horrible amalgamations, Maybe they've long since been freed of that wizard and are just trying to live their lives. They're not actually bad guys or evil as a stat block would suggest, but people are still horrified of them and the party is sent out to exterminate these monsters. Then maybe they realize they're not actually such bad people. Or maybe they don't and they kill them all anyways. That's the fun of D&D. But at the end of the day, these creatures are extremely powerful in terms of what they're built to do, which is melee combat primarily. But they have that unique twist to them in terms of sneaking around and of course there's just the shock factor for when your players first see what these things actually are. And they have a lot of really interesting lore implications and possibilities for that attached to them. So in my book that makes them just a well-rounded awesome creature that is always great to have in your monster manual. So if you've ever actually had these creatures used against you or if you have any plans to use them in an upcoming game, definitely tell me about it in the comments below or on Discord. 
And of course, if you have any suggestions for monsters you'd like to see in the future, same thing, comments, Discord, or even on Twitter, yell at me from whichever direction pleases you most. I am always listening. And of course, as always, if you do actually want to use this monster in your game, you can find a link to the stat block in the form of a Google document in the description below. You can also find it on D&D Beyond. That's also linked in the description below if you use that service. And if you are one of my lovely patrons, of course, you can get the whole kind of monster manual style stat block photoshopped all fancy like for you for the discerning dungeon master. And if you're not one of my patrons, I'd encourage you to check it out. Three bucks a month, you get fancy stat blocks and behind the scenes looks at what I am working on, which is usually stat blocks. Plus, it helps me pay bills. In any case, thank you guys so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And I will see you in the next video. Until then.